Uh, let's start at the very beginning. This is where he was born. He was born in uh, Parsonage House on the 29th of September in uh, 1758. Uh, his father, Edmund, was the uh, rector of the parish of Burnham Thorpe, so he was not a, a wealthy man. Here's his father. But his mother was formerly Catherine Suckling, and she was related to Robert Walpole, uh, the first British prime minister, and uh, <clears throat> Nelson was named Horace after uh, Hor Horace Walpole, his son, uh, and the owner of Strawberry Hill and Gothic writer. So there's his parents. Now, Catherine had 11 children. Nelson was the sixth. Uh, sadly, at the age of 42, Catherine died, uh, leaving Edmund with eight children to care for. Nelson at this stage was just nine years old. Now, Catherine's elder brother was one Captain Morris Suckling. Captain Suckling promised to find employment for the boys. Indeed, he said he'd take one to sea with him. So on the 24th of April, 1771, Nelson began his naval career aged just 12. The following year, he transferred to the Carcass with an ex expedition to the Arctic. And although still only 14, he was given a command of a four oared cutter. But to our eyes, well, 14 year old, that's still a boy, isn't it? And maybe that explains his nighttime attempt to kill a polar bear. While the story goes that one night when the ship was frozen in the ice north of Spitsbergen, Nelson and his shipmate left the ship armed with a rusty musket in search for polar bear. Nelson wanted the skin for his father. After a while, they spotted one and shot at it, but the gun misfired, leaving Nelson defenseless. It was at this stage that Nelson reportedly said that he wanted to get a blow at this devil with the butt end of this musket which is a scene that Westall has captured here. Meanwhile, back on his ship, his absence had been noted, and Captain Ludwig fired a blank charge from one of the ship's cannons to frighten away the polar bear. And you can see that in the background of the ship firing. The startled bear made off, but it is believed that had it not been for a great rift in the ice which prevented the bear from re uh, reaching him, Nelson would have been killed. Nelson's career progressed and at the age of 19, he passed his exams to become a lieutenant and was commissioned to serve on the lower staff. And it was in this ship that Nelson first showed his bravery or his lack of fear. The lower staff was serving in the North Atlantic. Uh, the captain was Captain William Locker and Nelson was serving as the second lieutenant in command of the schooner that was used as the ship's tender. It was called the Little Lucy, named after Locker's daughter. And the lowest off caught an American merchantman in the heavy Atlantic seas. And it was the duty of the first lieutenant to take command of the captured ship. A little boat was brought alongside to take him across. But as he looked down on that small boat tossing in the rough sea, he rather feared for his safety and suddenly remembered he'd left his sword in his cabin below. Captain Locker had a bit of a situation there and he asked for someone to volunteer to take command of the ship. And of course, you guessed it, Nelson volunteered. He had no fear for the rough sea. But Nelson always had an eye for the ladies and they for him. His first love was Mary Simpson. He met her in Quebec, but at only 16, she, she was a little young for marriage and certainly wasn't ready to marry Nelson. His next great love was Miss Elizabeth Andrews. He met her in France, he'd gone there to learn the language but she apparently was not ready for marriage either. Again, at least not with Nelson. By 1784, he was back in the West Indies where he met Mary Moutray. He was rather taken with her. Here's a picture of her. It's not terribly clear because you can, may have guessed it's taken from a miniature and I expanded it. Well, he was taken with her and so was his brother officer Cuthbert Collingwood. But she was married. She was married to the commissioner of Antigua and she soon returned to England with her husband. But strangely, Nelson kept up correspondence with her for the rest of his life. But Nelson soon found other consolation on the neighboring island of Nevis. There was a widow just a few months older than him, Frances Nisbet. Now Frances had lived on Nevis for most of her life. Her father had been the senior judge on the island, William Woolard, and she had married the doctor, Josiah Nisbet, who tended her father until his death. 
When the doctor's health deteriorated, they decided to return to England and they lived in Salisbury. But not long afterwards, Josiah died, leaving Frances with a young infant, also called Josiah. So what was she to do? But what she decided to do was to return to Nevis with her son and went to live with her uncle, John Herbert, who was the president of the Council of Nevis and a wealthy owner of a large estate, uh, a sugar plantation. And Francis acted as his hostess there. Francis was described as refined rather than pretty, with dark, clear eyes and softly curling brown hair and an English complexion. Well, in this picture, she looks rather severe. And this one, although it's in black and white, it does show her in a more favorable light. Nelson visited the home uh, of John Herbert. It was called Montpellier. And on his third visit, he met Francis and her young son. And so began the courtship. In due course, Nelson proposed. And he took the, had the courtesy to ask John Herbert for permission to marry his niece. John Herbert said, no, you must wait two years. They clearly met young and naval officers before. So they were married two years later in March 1787 in, at Montpellier. Francis was given away by Prince William Henry, the future William IV. He was serving under Nelson and Nelson was uh, uh, guiding him on seamanship and navigation skills. A few months later, they returned to England, first to London, then Bath, and finally settled in his father's house in Burnham Thorpe. Well, spare a thought for Frances. I have a soft spot for her. She found the weather cold and damp, a far cry from the sunshine and warmth that she was used to in the Caribbean. And indeed, it was a difficult time for them both. The Nelson was without a ship. And in those days, if you weren't serving on board ship, you were immediately put on half pay. They're not such a great catch. Nelson, uh, they went and lived with his father. Uh, in Burnham Thorpe in the rectory there. So maybe not such a great catch. Come and live with, uh, come back to England, live with my father and we'll manage on half pay. Well, Nelson found his father's land and adopted the lifestyle of a country gentleman. Despite the French Revolution of 1789 and the rise of this fellow, Napoleon, it was not until the execution of Louis XVI in January 1793 and the consequent declaration of war between England and France that Nelson finally got another ship. He spent over five years on half pay. In May 1793, Captain Nelson took command of the Agamemnon as part of Lord Hood's Mediterranean fleet and sailed for the Mediterranean. He sailed to Naples to request King Ferdinand to supply troops for the defense of Toulon. And there he met this young lady. What was the attraction? Emma, here she is. So who was Emma? We've all heard of Emma, so who was she? Well, she was the daughter of a Cheshire blacksmith who died when she was a young child. Um, we, there's no definite date when she was born. She was born on the 26th of April, um, about 1765, there, there's no record of it. And she was very coy about her age, so that's fine. Uh, in 1778, Emma moved to London with her mother and went into domestic service. And then into prostitution at the Temple of Health and at Madame Kelly's. Admiral Hood had decided that Corsica would be a good base for the Mediterranean fleet. Bit of a problem, the French were there. So first they had to take command of the towns of Bastia and Calvi, which were defended by the French. The British laid siege to Bastia, and after five weeks, the French surrendered and weren't hungry. But at Calvi, it was decided to attack the fort. And if you've sailed into Calvi, that is quite a big fort. It is a very big fort. And so then uh, Nelson was uh, given the responsibility for, of the unloading of the guns, 40 guns. Uh, they had to be hauled uphill over two miles of rough terrain. And then Nelson, along with 250 seamen, attacked the fort. And it was during the course of this action that he was wounded by a piece of splintered stone that hit him in the eye. And his eye, he made light of it at first, but in actual fact, his eye was badly injured. Um, he could at best um, tell light from dark. 
but he never wore an eye patch. Uh, I'll get so cross about that. At best, he would, wore a green, would wear a green eye shade over, over his uh, eye uh, to, to keep the sunlight off it. It was also in 1794 that Nelson had his first affair. Uh, he had an affair with Adelaide Corelia, uh, an Italian opera singer. Well, three years later in 1797, Nelson was back in action. He was at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in his ship, the captain. In this battle, Nelson again showed great bravery. He also disobeyed orders. Uh, he sailed out of line and personally led a boarding party that captured two Spanish ships, the San Joseph and the St. Nicholas, leaping from one ship to another. As a result of this, he was created Knight of the Bath and promoted to Rear Admiral. Oh, I know now how Nelson lost his eye, but how did he lose his arm? Well, this happened in action off uh, Tenerife. So the Battle of St. Vincent was the 14th of February, 1797. And in July of that year, Rear Admiral Sir Horatio Nelson was again in action. Uh, this time he was in Theseus. Nelson led a squadron to try to capture two Spanish treasure ships, sheltering with others in the well-defended harbor of Santa Cruz in Tenerife. Nelson decided on a direct assault on Santa Cruz by night. He led the assault himself with 11, uh, 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 one, yeah, 1,100 sailors and Marines, in, including Fanny's son. Do you remember Fanny had their young son, Josiah? He was now 17, he joined the Navy, was serving under Nelson, and he begged Nelson, let me come with you. Nelson said, oh, your mother was so worried. Anyway, fortunately he was there, for they soon found that they were expected. As Nelson was rowed ashore, his cutter was fired upon. Nelson was shot in his right arm above the elbow. Josiah laid him on the bottom board, took the black silk stock from around his own neck and tied it as a tourniquet. Nelson was forever grateful to Josiah, as he put it, saving his life. He then ordered the cutter to return. Back on the Thessios, Nelson's arm was amputated at the elbow. The amputation was agonizing. The cutting of the flesh with the cold knife was worse than the sawing of the shattered bone. In future, Nelson decreed that surgeons should heat their blades before operating. Might have helped with hygiene too. And of course, there was not much in the way of anesthetic. Nelson returned to England where Fanny nursed them in their lodgings as he began his long convalescence. But amazingly, by the spring of the following year, so we're up to 1798 now, Nelson, now age 40, was again fit for service. You can see here in this portrait, his sleeve tucked under his jacket. Nelson took command of Vanguard and sailed from the Solent to the Mediterranean. Napoleon hadn't gone away. Napoleon remained a major threat. A great fleet was being prepared at, at Toulon. Why? What was, it, what was the aim? Nelson was dispatched to discover where the French fleet was heading. There were concerns for Naples, Portugal, Turkey, countries of the Ottoman Empire. But Nelson believed that Napoleon was going to Alexandria to open up a trade route through to the Red Sea and on to India, where he'd link up with Tibu Saab, who was already causing problems with the British of the East India Company. Nelson searched the Mediterranean for the French squadron from Egypt to Sicily to Crete and back to Egypt, where they found the French fleet, not at Alexandria, but at Abukir Bay from 15 miles away. And this is what they found. A very accurate interpretation of the scene. So we've got the French fleet there and the British approaching. What they found was that many of the Frenchmen were on shore on watering parties or as armed escorts. The guns weren't run out and the gun ports were cluttered up with lumber. Nelson decided to take advantage of the unprepared fleet and attacked immediately. And so began the Battle of the Nile. Now, I know I said it was at Bay, but it is known as the Battle of the Nile. Captain Foley, the commander of the Goliath, spotted a weakness in the French position. 
The way the ships were anchored, there was room for him to pass between the leading French ship Guerrier, Le Guerrier, and the shore to the west. And you can see in the middle of the picture, the far end of, of the French fleet. Further, the French were not anchored close enough to, to each other. And there was room to break the line, raking an enemy as they did so. And by raking the enemy, there's firing to the uh, stern of the ship and the cannonball would go the whole way down, causing major injuries. So Captain Foley and Goliath led the attack on the inner side between the French fleet and the land with six ships. Meanwhile, Fred Nelson in Vanguard decided to keep entirely on the outer side of the French line with eight ships. The battle began at 6.30. We're in the Mediterranean by seven, it was dark, very dangerous to have a battle at sea in the dark. Uh, within a quarter of an hour, the first two ships of the French line had been dismasted. After two hours, four French ships had surrendered. Nelson himself was injured again when Le Spartiat fired a broadside. A flying fragment hit Nelson on the head. He was taken below to be treated. The battle couldn't wait. Uh, here's an interesting portrait. Uh, you can see here above his head the injury he received at the Battle of the Nile. And here's the battle scene. The most dramatic <coughs> incident of the battle happened at 10 p.m. And when there was a huge explosion on Lorient, it's showed here. Lorient was the flagship of the commander of the French fleet, uh, Admiral Bruys. And the ship exploded when the magazine caught fire. The ship had just been painted, and the oil jars and paint buckets were lying on the deck, which just added to the conflagration. The blast was so thunderous, it was heard in Alexandria, some <coughs> 15 miles away. The, the flag captain of Lorient, Captain Cassiabanca, was equally brave. He refused to save himself, knowing that his 13 year old son had been wounded taken below to the surgeon and was now trapped by fire. And of course, this is the origin of the poem we have sort of parodied at the school. The boy stood on the burning deck when all but he had fled. And the battle resumed. Only two French ships of the line and two frigates were fit to sail. And they were beating out of that bay as fast as they could, led by Rear Admiral Pierre Villeneuve, a name to remember. This was the most decisive battle of the Age of Sail. The French had lost 11 ships of the line out of 13. Strategically, the British had won control of the Mediterranean. But what of Nelson after that? Well, at the very least, he had a headache, if, if not concussion. Did he return to England for Fanny to nurse him? No, he went to Naples. When Nelson met the Hamiltons for the second time, Emma was about 33. But as striking as ever, her face was beautiful, and though she was putting on a bit of weight, she remained vivacious, flirtatious, had a great sense of humour. She arranged lavish celebrations for Nelson's victory, a dinner for 80, a ball for 1740. Nelson was clearly taken with Emma, describing her as an angel. Remember the bit on the dining table? Anyway, she was warm, generous and fun to be with and he no doubt enjoyed her attentions and the flattery. But this was already attracting comment. For Emma's part, this was a clear example of hero worship, adulation and admiration for the Admiral and the hero of the Battle of the Nile. Meanwhile, the French were marching on Naples. Nelson helped the king and queen escape with the Hamiltons to Palermo in Sicily in his ship, the Vanguard. During the crossing, there was a terrible storm and Emma cared for the queen and her children. The queen actually had 18 children, but she had eight with her. So she clearly had her hands full. Emma's resolution during the storm just increased the admiration of Nelson. Until now, their relationship had been an intense flirtation, but now they became lovers, and Emma was an experienced lover. The royal family, the Hamiltons and Nelson, lived in an extravagant lifestyle in the palace at Palermo for some four and a half months. 
Nelson was recalled to Menorca three times by Admiral Keith before he finally complied. His reputation in the British fleet was becoming somewhat reduced. He ignored advice to disassociate himself from Emma. And early in 1800, they conceived a child. He finally returned to England with the Hamiltons, not in vanguard, but out over, over land. Perhaps Emma didn't feel up to sailing. They went for Florence, Trieste, Vienna, Prague, Dresden, and finally on to Hamburg, where they caught the mail ship to Great Yarmouth. So it was not until November of 1800, but over two years after the Battle of the Nile, the Battle of the Nile was the 1st of August, 1798. So two, over two years later, uh, <coughs> that the uh, hero of the Battle of the Nile arrived in England. Once in England, he was created Baron Nelson of the Nile and received countless honors and presents given by municip municipalities. He spent that first Christmas of 1800 with the Hamiltons at Font uh, Fontill Bishop, staying with William Beckford. Afterwards, he was temporarily reunited with his wife, Fanny, almost forgotten her. But he soon left her and went to live with the Hamiltons. They lived as a menage a trois, causing a great scandal. Now, if you look first at his hat, um, in his hat is a a chelenka, a diamond aigret, or a plume of triumph, uh, made from 300 Brazilian diamonds. Um, it was presented to him by uh, the Sultan of Turkey. He took it from one of his own turbans to give to Nelson uh, as a reward for preventing Napoleon attacking Turkey and countries of the Ottoman Empire. Incidentally, behind the central diamond, um, there was a clockwork mechanism, so the whole thing could go round and round, if you like that kind of thing. Uh, a few years ago, uh, a copy of it was made, and here we've got a replica of it. Uh, I'm not, I don't think it's got the clockwork mechanism. Um, this was stolen from the National Maritime Museum in 1951, so if you come across it, they'd like it back. Around his neck are two naval gold medals. Only 22 of them were ever awarded. Nelson received three, one for the Battle of St. Vincent, one for the Battle of the Nile, and one after his death for Trafalgar. The third medal around his neck is the Alexander Davison Nile Medal. Alexander Davison was a friend of Nelson and also his prize agent, and he had these medals struck and uh, one was awarded to all uh, serving officers and ranks that fought at the Battle of the Nile. On his chest, well, the silver one with the crescent is member of the Ottoman Order of the Crescent. Again, it was presented to him by uh, the Sultan of Turkey. Uh, it was specially created for him as all other Turkish honors could only be given to Muslims. The next one down is the Knight Grand Cross of the Sicilian Order of Ferdinand and of Merit, uh, given to him by King Ferdinand of Naples and the Two Sicilies. Again, specially created for Nelson as all others uh, <coughs> awards could only be uh, given to uh, Roman Catholics. Uh, and the star-shaped one there, that is his Knight of the Most Honorable Order of the Bath. He received a, another award. He was made Knight Grand Commander of the Order of St. Joachim, uh, a four-pointed star, which was a private uh, order of chivalry, a German order of chivalry, but it's not shown in this portrait. Finally, he was created Duke of Bronte, and, <coughs> excuse me, and given an estate in the Sicily. Bronte was a vital source of timber, tar, hemp, and other naval stores. We're up to 1801 now, and in 1801, Nelson and Emma's daughter, Horatio, was born in the January. But in March, Nelson was appointed second in command to Sir Hyde Parker uh, as a fleet was prepared for the Battle of Copenhagen. It was during this battle that Nelson famously held the telescope to his blind eye. A very brief background to the battle, Britain was at war with France and maintained the right to search all ships uh, from the Baltic to see if they were carrying arms and ammunition for the French. The Baltic states rather resented this, 
And so Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Russia had formed the armed neutrality of the North with, uh, or in alliance with France. A fleet of 15 ships of the line was uh, sent to, de to persuade Denmark, which Britain had always had very close ties to, to withdraw from the armed neutrality of the North, either by amicable arrangement or by force. The diplomatic approach failed. Nelson proposed an assault on the Danish fleet off the coast of uh, Copenhagen uh, and led a squadron to attack from the south while Hyde Parker remained quite safely to the north. And you can see the idea was to uh, line up the ships uh, anchored opposite their opponents with Hyde Parker well out of the way. It was a well fought battle. Only 200 yards separated the British from the enemy and the Danes fought with utmost ferocity. They would do, wouldn't they? They were protecting their city, their country. At one o'clock, Admiral Hyde Parker, watching from some six miles away, so clearly using a telescope, uh, away to the north with the remainder of the fleet, feared the worst and signalled for Nelson to withdraw. It was at this point that Nelson, Nelson put his telescope to his blind eye and turned to his captain and said, you know, Foley, I have only one eye. I have the right to be blind sometimes. Keep mine for close battle flying, my signals for close battle flying. Well, not quite the famous quote of, I see no ships, more, I see no signal. The battle continued for another hour with considerable damage on both sides. Eventually a ceasefire became the only option and Nelson began negotiations. And the battle confirmed him as a popular hero. Napoleon had proclaimed himself an emperor, Today I shall be emperor and crowned himself. But it also built up an army of 120,000 men. There's no doubt that the invasion of Britain was to be his next campaign. He built a flotilla of specially designed boats to take troops across the channel. This is what the British press thought they looked like. But he needed his ships of the line to protect those troop carriers. The Nelson and the British fleet aimed to keep the French blockaded in port. If they were in port, they couldn't protect the troop carriers. And they prevented an attack on the south coast for, for nearly two years. Napoleon concentrated his troops around the northern ports of France. By 1805, Napoleon had forced Spain to declare war on Britain as well. And Napoleon, um, well, he was an army general, not a naval man. He devised this elaborate uh, diversionary strategy to draw the British away from the Channel. He ordered his admirals at Greff, Rochefort, Toulon to slip through the blockade and sail across the Atlantic and attack British possessions in the West Indies. He believed that this would draw the British fleet away from the Channel they would follow and leave the way free for the French invasion. So in March 1805, while Nelson was resupplying his ships in Sardinia, I don't think he could be criticised that he had to get fresh water and fresh food. He'd been blockading Toulon for a long time. While he was resupplying, Vice Admiral Pierre Villeneuve, the same Villeneuve that escaped from the Battle of the Nile, slipped through the blockade with his fleet and 3,000 troops. Nelson was soon in pursuit and thus began a great chase from the Mediterranean across the Atlantic. Nelson's search for Villeneuve among the various islands in the West Indies, from Barbados to Trinidad to Tobago to Antigua. Villeneuve, meanwhile, spent a month in the West Indies waiting for the other admirals to join him. They didn't come. They couldn't slip through the blockade. And then he heard that Nelson had followed him across the Atlantic. He'd met him before. He decided to return to Europe. When Nelson learned that Villeneuve was returning to Europe, he sent his fastest brig couriers to warn the Admiralty. So when Villeneuve reached Cape Finisterre off the northwest tip of Spain, he found a British fleet waiting for him, led by Vice Admiral 
as, as uh, Robert Calder, who engaged him in battle. It was a hard fought battle in very foggy conditions, and Calder only managed to capture two of the ships. But this engagement persuaded Villeneuve not to go back to the English Channel, but instead to retreat to Cadiz. When news of this retreat was brought to Napoleon, he was furious, but he was persuaded to abandon his plans to invade Britain and instead marched on Austria. And here he is looking thoroughly fed up uh, crossing the Alps here. Meanwhile, Nelson returned to England for some long overdue leave. He had, after all, been at sea for two years. He had not set foot on land for two years. But he had only three weeks, or 25 days anyway, with Emma and Horatia before being recalled. On the 14th of September, Nelson hoisted his flag aboard Victory and set sail, taking with him his portrait of Emma. On the 28th of September, Nelson joined the fleet of Cadiz, where Collingwood had been blockading the Franco-Spanish fleet in port. Of Cadiz, they kept a watchful eye on Vilna's Franco fleet, now numbering 33 ships. Nelson had 27 ships of the line with four frigates, a schooner and a cutter. These are the ships he had under his command. Nelson invited his captains to dinner half one night and half the next, and he <coughs> discussed uh, his battle plan with his captains. He decided he would divide his fleet into two divisions. Nelson in victory with the ships in the first column uh, in one division and Collingwood in Royal Sovereign in the other. On the 19th of October, Napoleon ordered Villeneuve to sail into the Mediterranean to Italy. He wanted those 3,000 uh, French troops plus another 2,000 Spanish troops to, uh, for, the, for, the, for his campaign against Austria. Nelson was ready for him. And this is where they were. Some people asked me if it, if it was in the English Channel. Um, this is where the battle took place. As, a, as the plan of attack was finalized, Nelson directed Lieutenant uh, Pasco to hoist the signal. England confides that every man will do his duty. Pasco asked, can I change? confides to expects, because that would be less flags. And thus, the famous signal was sent. England expects that every man will do his duty. The log books record when the battle started, 11.15, signal flown. The next signal at 12.15, engaged the enemy more closely. Nelson believed that no captain can do very wrong if he places his ship alongside that of an enemy. You can see from this picture that the enemy was made up of Spanish as well as French ships. There were 18 French and 15 Spanish. Now, strangely, uh, all the books say the same thing. Uh, on the decks of some of the ships, bands were playing cheerful nautical tunes. They would say the same. Uh, Heart of Oak and Rule Britannia. Um, You'd hardly think there was room, those of you that have been on victory, but um, presumably it raised morale. Here's another picture of the battle. This is from the National Maritime Museum. They have 606 uh, pictures relating to the battle. I haven't got copies of them all. The weather conditions are known. It was a pleasant autumn morning with very light wind. In order to maximize progress in the light winds, the British ships were under full canvas with studding sails and uh, royals, but they only achieved three, uh, uh, three knots. As planned, Nelson attacked with his fleet, divided into two parallel columns, you can see here in the diagram. And Collingwood in Royal Sovereign was first into action. Royal Sovereign had just been newly conquered, so we sailed uh, faster. And, hit, and Hollywood headed for the rear of the enemy fleet and fired a broadside into the Santa Ana. While Nelson, in victory, attacked the fleet flagship Bucentaur in the center. 
his chaplain, the Reverend Alexander Scott and the Dr. William Beattie were, were really concerned. The doctor was worried that the stars embroidered on his uniform would mark her out as a target for a sniper. Um, just remind you what he was wearing. So he was wearing his uniform, uh, not with the actual uh, medals, uh, but uh, well, here is his uniform. Nelson was indeed a target for a sharpshooter. At 1.15, he was struck in his left shoulder by a musket ball, fired by a sharpshooter sniper from Redditard's mizzen top. It smashed two ribs, tore through his left lung, severing a major artery on the way, and lodged in his spine. You can see where he was shot here. The whole Nelson not wishing to the, the crew to see that he had been shot, covered his face and his, his scars with his handkerchief and was taken below to the surgeon. Just leave him on deck for a moment. On the all up deck, Nelson was put in a midshipman's berth and the surgeon, Mr. Beatty, attended him. Nelson said, Mr. Beatty, you can do nothing for me. I have a, but a short time to live. My back is shot through. BT examined the wound and realised that Nelson was right. There was nothing he could do. He sent a message to Harden to tell him that Nelson was dying. It was another hour before Hardy came to see him. I, I don't think we should, can blame Hardy. He was a bit busy. They were in the middle of a battle. He was commanding the ship and the fleet. Nelson told Hardy that he was dying. He asked Hardy not to throw his body overboard as, as when he died, as was usual. He said he wanted to be buried alongside his parents. And then added the typical lack of modesty. Unless the king should order otherwise. Then asked Hardy, take care of my dear Lady Hamilton. Followed by, kiss me, Hardy. I can't see you all there, but I'm sure half the men are shaking their heads and saying, no, he would never have said that. What he actually said was kismet, Hardy, the Arabic or Turkish word for, um, the, for, the, for fate. But I can assure you that no contemporary evidence supports this. Um, Dr. William Beattie wrote an account of the death of Nelson. It's 100 pages long, and I have a copy of it. Hardy kissed him. He kissed him on his cheek. Nelson said, thank God I've done my duty. Hardy knelt, knelt again and kissed his forehead. And here we have him in the Orlop deck. The logbook records, partial firing continued until 4.30 p.m. When a victory having been reported to the Right Honorable Lord Nelson K.B. and Commander-in-Chief, he died of his wounds. Battle was over. When the battle finally ended, 17 ships had been captured and another was a blazing wreck. The battle was won. Napoleon was thwarted. He could not invade Britain without a fleet to protect his flotilla of troop carriers. That victory meant that Britain ruled the waves for the next 100 years. The light at the victory was replaced by mourning for the death of Nelson. The next day there was a great storm. Captain Blackwood described it as a hurricane. It lasted a week. Many of the prizes were lost. On the 28th of October, victory was towed into Gibraltar for repairs. Nelson's body was placed in one of victory's largest water casks and filled up from the ship's supply of brandy. At Gibraltar, it was topped up with spirits of wine. The cask was lashed to the main mast and guarded day and night by a marine sentry as the ship sailed home with a temporary jury mast. News of the death of Nelson reached London on the 6th of November. And the schooner HMS Pickle took the message home, commanded by Lieutenant John Le Penetier, and this was reported in the Times uh, two days later. Victory herself arrived back on the 5th of December. Dr. Beatty performed an autopsy and extracted the fatal bullet from Nelson's body. 
hospital from Nelson's back and the body was placed in uniform, dressed in uniform and placed in a coffin. The coffin lay in state at the painted hall of the Royal Hospital in Greenwich for three days. And then Nelson's funeral took place on Thursday, the 9th of January, 1806 at St. Paul's Cathedral. His body was placed in a black sarcophagus originally made for Cardinal Wolsey. <laughs>